Hello and welcome back to Business Matters at the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. Last week, Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated a 2G ethanol plant put up by the Indian Oil Corporation in Panipat at a cost of about 900 crore. 2G ethanol? Sounds intriguing to you if you haven't heard of it before. You've heard of 4G and 5G in telecom spectrum, but in ethanol, what is 2G? Let's get into the details. Ethanol blended with petrol helps burn lesser of fossil fuels by substituting at least a portion of the volume of the fuel that goes into your petrol tank with ethanol, an agricultural byproduct. It's obtained mostly as a byproduct when sugarcane is used to process sugar, but it can also come from other sources such as rice husk or maize. What is the composition of petrol that goes into your fuel tank today? 10% of that volume is ethanol. Though India has had an E10 or a 10% blended ethanol policy for a while now, it's only this year that we've breached that target. Our eventual target was to get to E20 or 20% blending of ethanol with petrol by the year 2030. But last year, when Niti Aayog put out an ethanol roadmap for the country, that target date was advanced by five years to 2025. Why is ethanol blending important for a country like India? Two reasons. First, we import as much as 85% of our oil needs, which means we use our precious foreign exchange reserves to make such purchases. The ethanol roadmap of June 2021 tells us India's net import of petroleum was 185 million tons, purchased at a cost of about $55 billion for the year ended March 2021. And that a successful ethanol blending program can save the country $4 billion per annum. The second reason, with ethanol purchases made by the government, we hope to increase farmers' incomes over time. And as we get into the discussion, let's see how that happens. But let's answer the question that we first asked in this discussion. Why 2G ethanol? How is it different from 1G? So ethanol derived from molasses. Molasses is a byproduct that you get when you process sugar from sugar cane. So the ethanol thus derived is referred to as first generation or 1G ethanol. But to help augment supplies, the government has allowed for processing of ethanol from other sources like rice straw, wheat straw, bagasse, woody biomass, corn cobs, and so on. So ethanol derived from these other sources, other than sugar, is referred to as second generation or 2G ethanol. How have other countries fared? Countries like the US, China, Canada, Brazil, including India, all of us have an ethanol blending program. But for comparison purposes, if you look at Brazil, a developing country like India, it stands head and shoulders above the rest. It had legislated that ethanol blended with petrol must account for about 18 to 27.5 percent of volume and by 2021 it had breached 27 percent. We've talked about the composition of petrol that goes into your vehicle, government objectives and so on, but what does this mean for the auto industry? At the time that the ethanol roadmap was rolled out last year, the industry had committed to making all vehicles introduced after April 1st, 2023 as E20 material compliant, which means Wherever the fuel touches materials such as plastic, rubber, steel and so on, all of these materials can take in petrol that has been 20% blended with ethanol. Without such a change in material, rusting would be an obvious impediment. Rajesh Menon, Director General SIAM or the Society for Indian Automobile Manufacturers tells us that by April 1st, 2025, the industry would become E20 engine compliant, which means all vehicles introduced after that date would have engines that can process petrol that has been blended 20% with ethanol. But can the industry afford such new investments, especially as it is just emerging from a pandemic-induced sales shock? Sources in the auto industry tell us that the industry would much rather prefer this incremental investment needed for these biofuels. After all, there are several options facing the industry right now. Over the next 5 to 10 years, the industry could take one of these three or four major routes. One is the move completely to electric vehicles. Electric vehicles don't need engines, they just need motors and the whole design could change. Then you have hydrogen powered vehicles, that seems slightly into the future. Then you have CNG and LNG uh, gases that help power your vehicles. And then of course you have biofuels like ethanol that gets blended with petrol. So among all of these options, the industry seems far more comfortable because there's only an incremental investment needed for vehicles compatible with biofuels. With India having committed to a net zero emission promise by 2070, industry cannot sit back and say we won't contribute. They will have to when compared to all the options ahead of them, this seems the biofuels path seems the least costly to them. So much for new vehicles that come in after April 1st of 2023 and 2025. 
but how about your existing vehicles can they handle e20 i just bought a vehicle two months ago i don't think i'd be ready to change it by 2025 just because my vehicle cannot take e20 petrol the niti io report that details the ethanol roadmap last year did point out that there are challenges that exist before the industry first you have to optimize the engine for higher blends of ethanol with petrol then conduct durability studies on these engines and field trials before introducing e20 compliant vehicles sources in the industry tell us that the sector is in talks with the government there are several issues at stake here because if the government and the industry decide that E10 has to be supplied separately for the older vehicles and E20 for the new ones, then that increases storage costs. So multiple points at play here. As the situation evolves, things will become clearer and we'll keep you posted. Even if the auto industry gets its compliance priorities right, there are risks from other quarters. For instance, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis in a report in March has indicated the poor use of land if we prioritize ethanol production. The report's author, Charles Warringham, tells us that we are far better off using land to generate renewable power from solar energy. For example, to match the annual travel distance of EVs or electric vehicles recharged from one hectare generating solar energy, 187 hectares of maize-derived ethanol are required, even accounting for losses from electricity transmission, battery charging and grid storage. Now let's take a look at the impact of such an exercise on environment. There are both pros and cons to this. When a farmer sells stubble that is left behind after he harvests rice or wheat, first he is able to monetize it. He makes money out of something that he could not otherwise have sold. Second, there is lesser stubble burning and hence lesser air pollution. By reducing the burning of stubble left behind after a rice harvest, the 2G ethanol project that was inaugurated last week will help cut emission of greenhouse gases equivalent to about 3 lakh tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Think of it as replacing about 63,000 cars on our roads annually. Now let's look at the somewhat less than positive impact on the environment, groundwater. An explainer in our newspaper back in May tells us that one ton of sugarcane typically gives us 100 kg of sugar and 70 liters of ethanol. That means to produce one liter of ethanol from sugar, you need 2,860 liters of water, almost 3,000 liters. To save water, the nation could move towards ethanol derived from coarse grains, as has been articulated by the ethanol roadmap rolled out last year. This could be from rice straw, wheat straw, and so on. But concerns abound about the supply. The International Council for Clean Transportation feels that the Niti Aayog may have been sanguine on the supply front. It says that the abnormally wet monsoon seasons in the last few years have helped raise grain output, but the council is skeptical whether that production level can be sustained in the coming years. It points out that the roadmap assumes a whopping fourfold increase in grains production from 2021 to 2025. Let's place all of this in context. Mr. Warringham, whose report we referred to earlier in this discussion, tells us it's likely that sugarcane would continue to be the primary source for ethanol production going forward, even given the 12 distilleries that will be coming up and will produce ethanol from farm waste or 2G ethanol. The first of these was inaugurated last week and that has capacity to produce about 100 kiloliters a day. Mr. Warringham points out that the roadmap talks about an additional 800 crore liters of ethanol capacity required to meet our targets. He says, unless the other 11 plants that will come up in the future have a much higher rate of production, then we may not be able to meet our targets. If he says all those 11 plants have similar capacities as the one inaugurated last week, all of them together would probably account barely for 5% of what we would need to meet our targets. That brings us to the next question. Are our projections for ethanol production too optimistic for the future? A graphic that the ICCT or the International Council for Clean Transportation gives us a visual sense of the steep increase in coarse grains output needed to meet the target by 2025-26. Mr. Warringham also flags the impact of such an exercise on crop output for food and animal fodder. He says that there are already indications that sugarcane production is increasing and at the India Maize Summit in May, the Government of India encouraged maize production citing ethanol production as a reason for this push. 
in his typical style, he says that sugar and grain production that end up in the petrol tank cannot also come onto your dinner plate, be used as animal fodder, be stored in warehouses or exported. He also warns of how difficult, increasingly difficult it is to predict harvest outputs. He cites the example of the wheat harvest earlier this year. We thought we'd have a surplus. Instead, we were affected by climate change induced heat waves. He says such climate change induced patterns are a worrying feature and could lead to lower than expected harvest with little notice. If we take the example of maize, Mr. Warringham is quick to point out that currently global maize production has come down. In France, the harvest has dipped 19% this year and the forecast for production has been revised downwards for at least seven other countries in Europe. The US also has slightly revised downwards its maize production outlook. In this context, there could be two options for India, both of which do not seem favorable for ethanol production. Either India's maize output is normal as expected and it could export more or India could also be affected in the future like other countries are, in which case, you know, we'll have lesser maize available to produce ethanol. Given all this uncertainty about future production, India will have to walk a delicate line between retaining past priorities as well as adding new ones. Mr. Waringham says that India may not find it easy to simultaneously strengthen domestic food supply systems, set aside adequate stocks for lean years, maintain an export market for grains and divert grain to ethanol at the expected rate in coming years. And this, he says, is an issue that warrants continued monitoring. If we keep to the ethanol roadmap, very interesting times lie ahead for our country. Let's see how the situation evolves. We'll keep you posted on this. Till the next episode of Business Matters, it's goodbye from us. Have a lovely week ahead.